we got the development down. Well, I'll say down, it got improved. So the next thing we started to look at was our kind of after-sales support. Um, a lot of what we do is for third-party integrators. So because we produce um, soap web services at the moment, um, people have to connect to those and work with them. And then um, the, the finance and insurance world are quite complex. So, well, it's hard if we try to document some of it and explain it and make the ap applications easy to use. There's still a lot of hard work to go on when people integrate with us. So our support is very important to us. And um, we've also got people that um, have obviously paid for certain features in the system that don't always work. We've got defects and this sort of thing. So um, we had um, the support system was two developers uh, would be on support for a day. And then at the end of the day, you'd swap and someone else would be on support. So that meant answering the phones, doing basic admin work, and then creating any defect card that could then go on the Kanban board for um, the waste time and the slack time, the gaps in between MMFs. The problem with this, though, is that the handovers cause a lot of, a lot of waste. So if, if I was on support one day and then Neil was on the next, we'd have to spend like half an hour handing things over the next morning. Um, and then even though I'd be on development two days down the line, someone might have to come and ask me about someone that had eventually replied three days later. And uh, it meant you were interrupted when you were on development. And that was the whole point of having support, so we could concentrate on it and not interrupt development. Um, so, again, we decided to uh, put some changes into place for that. What we did was, it is we decided to have uh, a dedicated uh, support desk because at first uh, the developers that were on support would set in with the team. Uh, and at that time we were working in a place that was two large rooms with uh, a larger door between the two. Uh, so we moved the desk uh, outside to allow the developers to focus on uh, their work and uh, we also uh, turned, the d turned the support into uh, a two-week sprint uh, so nobody had to keep on uh, nipping in to ask this or ask X or Y after uh, a reply after uh, two or three days. So that helped, uh, and it uh, helped a lot the the uh, external uh, clients because when they phoned back after a day, two days, they uh, spoke to the same person who uh, knew the score on uh, their, their thing that they uh, needed fixing. So that uh, helped us out. And at that time as well, we uh, also uh, adopted the Zendesk uh, support uh, system, which we uh, still use now, uh, and that works great because it, it's uh, a full-scale uh, support uh, system. So it's uh, in the cloud as well, so we can just work straight on that. Yeah, so we got after-sales support a bit better now. Um, we managed to collaborate with customers better, um, in the planning stages we could predict stuff um, but we still had a problem during development we couldn't um, collaborate with customers in the way that we wanted to and now Agile Manifesto says you, ne you need more customer collaboration so um, the structure we had at that time was development director or managing director as he is now and then the development team and there was no one in between there were no business analysts or um, project managers or anything like that so we decided to um, uh, look at what the problems we were, we were having um, with the uh, the gap between that, um, we had a look at getting like an on-site customer, but because our customers are the likes of BMW and uh, Porsche and things, and they're all over the the world, and we can't really have someone for that particular customer on time on site all the time. Um, so we looked at some some other strategies, and then as the managing director became busier and busier, we noticed that developers were just taking on the role of the the product uh, the product owner there yet they were making wrong assumptions, they didn't know all the business decisions behind it, they would not been able to speak to the correct people at the customer. Um, we, still, we still managed to speak to the customer and get some requirements, but because we didn't know the whole picture, because we were more concentrated on development, um, we, we were ended up doing uh, work that we shouldn't be doing, and uh, we're doing, uh, adding in features that we, just, we only assumed we wanted and we didn't actually need. Um, so again, we made some more changes. So. What we did was, is we uh, appointed uh, an operations manager from uh, inside the team. Uh, and his job, as such, was to be uh, a proxy product uh, 
Oh no. Uh, so uh, he talks uh, directly to the customers, uh, uh, assesses their needs. Uh, he says no when when uh, he needs to, uh, but he's on site. So uh, we we can now just go uh, straight to him and say, what should this do? How should that work? And he's uh, on the next desk, so he's. Uh, always about. Uh, also we found as well that, that we weren't uh, demonstrating things uh, on test. So like we go, yeah, looks fine, and then uh, straight out to live, and sometimes uh, it was wrong. So uh, part of his job as well now uh, is that he uh, sits down and uh, he'll set the uh, acceptance uh, criteria uh, on cards, uh, on the board, and then we'll uh, have that down and he'll work through them all and then uh, sign that off as such. Uh, so we can now uh, maximise the work not done uh, because we uh, tend to do the right thing straight away. Yeah, yeah because we've got um, some kind of behaviour driven uh, acceptance tests we're not, we, didn't, we don't produce those and then drive the code from that all the time. It's more test-driven stuff that we do um, from a unit test uh, type of thing. Um, so these acceptance criteria uh, are worked with the customer and with the product owner and the developers so that we can then go through that before it gets deployed to demo. Um, but even though we'd managed to stop defects going out, we still noticed that the, the, um, the code quality wasn't quite as high as we wanted it to be. Um, it's still taking a while to develop things. The uh, deployment process was was slow, and there were just um, bottlenecks in in support. Um, we noticed that even though we managed to split the uh, the streams, there were still areas of the applications that needed to be worked on at the same time. And when we we're working on these, they were too close together. So um, a good example is um, you'd work on a feature, and it, it it because one feature would be partially developed, another feature was ready to go out, it had bottlenecked the deployment of that feature. Um, and we didn't want that to happen so that we could um, get things out within, within a day. Um, because we were coming into the trunk all the time and trying to uh, respond, we were always trying to bring down our, our time from planning to deploying to live um, as much as we can. So we managed to slice down the requirements and the features um, from the larger MMF that we, I talked about earlier. Um, but we still weren't able to get these out for technical issues and that just didn't seem right. So. Uh, we, we knew something had to change there. It was um, quite difficult to stick to the single piece flow of things, so we ended up working on multiple products at once just because the delay in getting things out was so large. So we um, eventually got it down to um, one day for a development of a feature, um, yet to actually deploy this meant that, uh, because other things were in development as well, it, 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 depending on what time they were started, they'd, they'd bottleneck each other. Um, this meant that the value was lost upstream as, uh, the as we were trying to push things through into demo and extra um, code was being half deployed. And we brought back problems we previously had um, over 18 months ago as well where we were deploying partially built features. So um, we knew that we had to do something about uh, the code. Um, one of the, uh, uh, the, the first things we identified were that we didn't have um, as many integration tests as we wanted. So although we got quite a lot of different modules within inside the application, um, they didn't quite gel together as well as we thought. Um, so we looked at doing lots of acceptance tests and system-wide tests, but we tried this before and failed at it. And we also noticed that it was quite laborious to do this sort of thing. So we wanted something slightly different. Um, so either a code architecture change or ch the change the way that we're doing testing. Yeah. So uh, what we did was, is we started to look at uh, look to try and move towards a uh, service oriented uh, architecture, which again is a, a, a lot like the HUD. <laughs> uh, so this really uh, started off with, with uh, small uh, internal changes based on the uh, solid uh, principles where we'd start and use uh, service uh, objects and uh, separate the uh, classes out into roles uh, as they uh, should be. Uh, we were lucky at, uh, at that time that uh, Brian Maddock was on 
uh, a tour as well. So uh, he called in and uh, helped us out with uh, introducing mocks, um, which was quite good because we were we were starting to uh, move from a, a, a TDD to a, a BDD style, and uh, I think that's just a, a, a standard move uh, as teams grow. Yeah, we're trying to uh, test the collaboration between objects and the messages passed rather than the inputs and outputs, which is what we've been traditionally, yeah. um, it's a traditional TDD, sounds like. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's called a uh, London School of London School. They like to call it now. Style, yeah. Uh, and we uh, uh, also uh, started to move to a version in uh, our uh, API um, objects and separating them all into separate modules. We 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 do have uh, old code that's still uh, uh, hard to test and uh, hard to move, but uh, we uh, just keep on. Uh, chipping away at that, uh, and bit by bit, uh, it will get there. <laughs> so. Yeah, so we reduce the coupling between the different services um, it, like in the internal application, um, so that we can also, um, I spoke to Bob Hughes earlier about, um, we're one of the companies that uses SOA externally as well, so people can get the data from us from our web services for the insurance and the, the finance, but a lot of the separation of the internal services that we're, we're able to do, we can now offer those externally. So where a finance calculation would go and fetch a vehicle to get its make, model, and derivative, um, we can now offer that as, as a separate service. So this has had a business benefit um, in sort of commercial terms as well as speeding us up and making the code easy to use and that sort of thing. So, um, I mean, that was we're looking at the customer collaboration, the code's better now, so we start to look at how we were inspecting and adapting what we were doing. We noticed that at a time that um, we'd have retrospectives and there'd be just a big moaning session and we'd sit there and um, talk about the problems we had, whereas what we wanted to do was look for things that were, um, we could action and try and improve. Um, and it was it's good that we were, we were taking notes and things and people had, quite a lot of people attend the, uh, the retrospectives, but then no action was taken from them and it was just people were just sat around talking. Um, you know, one of the uh, um, main issues that sort of highlighted the whole thing was that the same problems would come back week on week, um, and that was entirely what we were, we were against. I mean, if you notice our branding in there, it's it's now um, love to improve, and we just weren't improving. We were we love to talk about what we like to improve, but we weren't actually action in it, and uh, that's simply because our retrospective format and the way that we dealt with the problems just wasn't effective.